tardes a todos los que Hello, estáis. Good afternoon, everyone who is at the other side of the screen. Welcome, welcome to this event towards a fair tourism that is low in carbon. Thank you so much for being here. These are topics that are very interesting to all of us because we all travel or we um, are asked to travel. It has to do with economy and the environment. My name is Rosa Tristan and I will be the mother for this event. First of all, I wanted to thank La Casa Encendida for this um, series, La Casa On, that they have organized for one month and a half for allowing for these topics to be included. I also wanted to thank the Foundation Transición Verde, Green Transition, and the European Greens Foundation uh, for organizing this web this web round table, this virtual round table, which is what we are expected to do in this new normal that we are all in. So we have been closing our frontiers for months, closing regions, closing cities. We're even been locked down in our homes. So this is a situation that has actually gotten to us when the capacity to travel for human beings had uh, broken all records. We were now uh, capable of moving millions of people from one part um, of the planet to the other constantly. And we were even planning space travels. But now COVID-19 has come here and has cut our wings. So countries like Spain have suffered a lot. We have gone from 75,000 um, tourist visitors um, in 2019 to only, seven, only 18 million. So tourism represents 12% of our GDP in Spain, and it is a sector that has completely sunk. But this climate, this uh, climate, this economic crisis has to add up to the climate crisis that also has an impact on tourism, and tourism also has an impact due to the emissions that it generates and other impacts. It is having an impact on climate change, increasing it. So it is a a phenomenon and a sector that are very much intertwined and who's best to talk about this than the speakers that we currently have here today around this table. I wanted to give the warmest welcome to everyone who's at the other side of the Atlantic. I know that there are people listening to us from the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you so much for being connected to this round table. I know that there are many tourism students who are looking at, at, at what we're going to be tackling here. They're the future of this sector and I hope that this will be of interest to them. And I am now going to introduce to you the three people who are here today with us who obviously will be answering to your questions if you want to write them down on the chat box as the debate goes along. We have Aurora Pedro Bueno. Aurora, good afternoon. How are you? She is the director of New Green Transition at the University of Valencia. She's a professor of the university and she's a consultant of the World Tourism Organization. She is part of the quality certification for tourism education. And she is in different teams that usually try to promote the quality of tourism. So she is perfect for this, for this debate. She has organized courses on this topic in many different countries, many of them in Latin America, according to what I have seen. And she has published lots of articles on, on that topic. So thank you so much, Aurora, for being here with us this afternoon. We also have Javier Benayas. Hello, Javier, how are you? Uh, Javier is a professor of ecology at the University Autónoma of Madrid, and he's a member of the Advisory Council of the Spanish Network for Sustainable Development. A few days ago, three days ago, they actually presented the last report issued by this network that talks about the impact and how they are fulfilling or not fulfilling the uh, sustainable development goals in the in different um, in different city councils in Spain, uh, over a hundred city councils, he was the vice rector for environment uh, environmental quality at the Universidad Autónoma, and he is currently the co director of master for the management of protected and natural spaces. I have coincided with him in the Antarctic, and he has been very much involved in the evolution of tourism in the Antarctic, because although it is very far away, it is one of the spaces where, um, as a percentage, tourism is going up. This year is also weird for this for tourism in that region. 
But I also wanted to say that he is the co-author of a guide to consider the degree of involvement of tourism with these sustainable development goals. So he's going to be able to tell us lots of things in that sense. Thank you so much, Javier, for being here with us today. And lastly, I would like to say that we will have around this table, although she's not present here yet because she had prior commitments and she could not make it from the beginning. I don't know if she's now present. Karima Deli, she is an MP, a European MP, uh, since 2009 for the Greens. Ever since her second mandate in 2014, she was member of the Transportation Commission and Tourism Commission, and she is the president of this commission currently. In 2016, another sector that she works in um, since 2016 is that of transportation and tourism. She's a member of the commission. I'm sorry, no, research with regards to emissions in the auto sector, automobile sector. She is uh, actually in charge of the diesel gate, as we call it. So it has to do with emission and pollution. She knows a lot about mobility and we know that there is no tourism without mobility. So she is also going to be able to enrich this debate as a European MP. She's going to be able to tell us what is happening in, happening in Europe and what are future perspectives. So I don't know if Karima in this last few minutes has been able to connect and I will introduce her to you if she hasn't, and you will be able to see her in the screen and we will be able to ask her questions. Okay, so to begin breaking the ice, I wanted with, to start with a question to Aurora. Aurora, I'm afraid I'll be breaking the ice with you around this table because we are actually at a time in history where tourism has completely sunk over but in Spain it's quite significant due to what I said previously because it is a very high percentage of our GDP so according to um, information that we have over 22 million jobs have been lost in the EU that are linked to the sector so a few hours ago I was hearing in the news that part of the problem part of the, the problem of the people who live in Morocco in certain areas um, reasons why people, young people are going all the way to the Canary Islands is because the tourism has also sunk in Morocco and they have lost their way to, to, to make ends meet. And I would like to ask you, this, this crisis, this touristic crisis, I am focusing now in Spain as well, would have been different if we had had a different perspective with regards to the sector, or was it unavoidable? And could you tell us what answers are being given globally, politically, to try and find an exit, a, a solution to all of this. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think that um, the, this, this crisis in tourism um, has been one of the, of the phenomena that has to be highlighted most in this crisis, because I think that one of the sectors that has been most impacted has been tourism, not just in Spain, because we are the first or one of the first countries with regards to um, tourism reception. We're usually the second, but I usually um, ha do nuances in that hierarchy. But we are, I would say we're, um, if not the most visited country, we are the leader in many aspects tourism and as you were saying other in other areas such as Morocco as well and the world over in general because tourism is linked to mobility and it is impossible to conceive a tourism without having to travel somewhere so during this pandemic where we have limited contact and we have we have promoted or asked for people to be socially distanced well somehow they have prevented us from, from traveling and from being tourists. So I honestly think that this was unforeseeable. This was completely unforeseeable and it is very complicated nowadays until we don't have a solution such as a vaccine or a treatment, um, some definitive drug. We cannot, have, we cannot make any forecasts. Plans to dynamizing tourism have been thought for a very long time. In summer, we had a plan in Spain 
which was, I believe, too hurried. It was not timely. It was a response to the pressure that entrepreneurs were making, because we have to understand, obviously, that there are lots of people who are being impacted by this, lots of people who are closing down their businesses, lots of people who are losing their jobs. So I understand, obviously, that there was lots of pressure. There, People were very worried, and there was a need to give an answer from the government. But I think that it was too hurried. This plan was too hurried. And in a pandemic situation such as the one that we are living, it was very difficult to dynamize tourism. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. Okay. Maybe they should have waited a bit, shouldn't they? Yes, yes. I personally think that they should, they should have waited. I mean, politically, it was not advisable to wait because as I said, it was obvious within the sector that there was a high demand and a very um, strong pressure for the government to do something. And they were giving examples of Greece, Portugal, and so on. And it was as though we, we were not doing anything, which was not really true either. But I, I had the feeling that it was a plan that that needed to be done, obviously, because if we could help, we should do it. But it was very complicated. It was very difficult for the tourism um, to really have an impact in summer, a significant impact. It was too hasty. And from a European level, I was asking you about the European answer. How have you seen that European answer? Well, I think that what we haven't had is a homogenous um, answer by everyone. Europe is still, um, is still not reacting. Um, with regards to tourism, I think that Europe, we think about tourism because it affects mainly the south, uh, southern countries of Europe. But we need a more, a more solid response by the EU, a more decided answer. And that would happen. And I actually want to say this. We have said it um, often, but we have Karima here and she could talk about that. But I think that she could really illustrate the situation. But I think that we need to have a European um, policy for tourism. It was something that was dis that was talked about a few years ago, but they decided that it wouldn't be a European policy, that they said that, um, that it should be local, it should be national. But I think that it would be good for Europe to to understand the relevance that tourism has as an economic sector. Yes, okay, so Karima is here, welcome, welcome. Hello, how are you? Very well, and how are you? Well, we're happy to have you here. Okay, so Aurora was saying that maybe you could tell us a bit more about this, about, about, about this. Do you think that at some point we will be able to have a European touristic policy for all of Europe and, if possible, a fair policy and low in carbon? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, sorry, I, I don't speak very well in Spanish, really. Uh, so I, I speak in, in, in English, okay? The same for you? Yeah. Perfecto. Lo entendido, pero no hablo muy bien español. So. <laughs> okay. We have translation. <laughs> okay, that's right. So tourism is one of the, the main engines of the Spanish economy, but the current crisis of the COVID-19, other economic crisis of 2028 uh, did before, has shown the fragility of the sector and has called into question the high dependence of the GDP on this activity. In Europe, this activity is 12.5% is very enormous sectors. There is a constant talks of saving the economy, focusing on saving the hotel or the catering industry, uh, hotel, airline, without considering a new alternative, except for occasional solution uh, while waiting for the business to return to what it was with arrival of the vaccines. But the situation requires a more profound re reflection. 
because at this moment we need a reflection about mass tourism. I say that because almost 80, 84 million in Spain in, uh, in 2019. As a, a black future, not only because the pandemic will make uh, before and after, but because there is another parallel crisis, the climate crisis. Uh, yes, which also affects the sector because it generates water shortage, a decrease in climate comfort, uh, loss the, of the beach, the beach of dues, the rising sea levels, and increases in extreme weather, phenomenal, phenom phenomena, fluids. So, in, in turn, my responsibility, we need to change this sector. It's a time. Substantial tourism, what is it concretely? Local tourism, what is it concretely? The tourism as an activity generates environmental damage, destruction of course, environmental pollution increases as well. So in this context, we are going to analyze the, the I believe the lesson. We need to in to analyze this lesson that we can draw from the health in pandemic. In other we think we think a change toward a far low carbon tourism model that is prepared to face the major climate, economic and social challenges of our time. And this is sustainable in the long term. So we need to prepare this. It's not only uh, for now, but it's the future too. That's the reason why my transport committee we created a tax force in tourism. Specialized to say two very important goals. First of all, we cannot, we cannot do the new political without the actor, the local actors, first of all. And we need a definition, what we want to, tomorrow, what is concretely, what are be the criteria, the indicators about the sustainable local tourism. And the last but not the least, because during, during this crisis, we need investment. We need to help these actors of tourism because it's a catastrophe. The link between this crisis with employment is a catastrophe. That's the reason why, at this moment in the European budget, I fight with the Council to create for the first time just a, a new line in the budget specific for the tourism sectors. But we need to fight, it's, not, it's very hard. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Eh, Karima, justamente mencionabas ahora a los actores. But you were actually mention, mentioning the local actors that they have to be taken into account and that it needs to be a low carbon tourism and the tourism for the future. And I would like Gen Javier Benayas, who has worked a lot on this topic, to tell us what's the current situation. What's the situation of this tourism? Do we really have a tourism that can be sustainable? That and what's the what are the characteristics of this tourism and could it be extrapolated to to other initiatives to more um, general initiatives yes hello everyone aurora karima um, it's a pleasure to share this this virtual space for the exchange of such hot topic such a hot topic because i believe this is a key topic for the future i don't know if tourism is the first industry world industry above oil and if it's not it will be very soon and they were the it was the sector that had the greatest uh, growth growth rates so this is a world industry that has been impacted by this crisis and we now have to rethink this crisis we have to refocus because obviously it was generating problems, something that grows so fast um, and so much 
obviously gen has collateral effects, as we usually say. If we do not contemplate those collateral effects, obviously they will end up generating important problems. So, muy importante. Es decir, eh, yo creo que ya en los no. últimos años se estaban planteando alternativas al turismo. Eh, We were alternatives to tourism in the, in the last few years. Compensar, eh, the, way, the best way to compensate the problems that tourism generates are the uh, carbon footprint and to pay for that problem that tourism is generating. I, we did a study in the With regards to the emissions that an average tourist would produce, there was obviously, uh, for instance, um, a Spaniard who wants to retire to Antarctica, how, how many emissions would they emit in 15 days? And it was around six tons, which is the equivalent of the emissions of a Spaniard during a whole year. So in 15 days, he emits as much as he would during a whole year. En su vida cotidiana, in en his day-to-day -day in a um, Western country with a high level of consumption, obviously. Now, the price right now in the market, I don't know how much uh, the ton, the CO2 ton is worth, but I think it's around 25, 30 euros. So if we were to decide 30 euros per six tons, it would be 180 euros, let's say 200 to round it up. So that trip to, um, to the Antarctic, it would cost eight to 10,000 euros to that tourist. So those 200 euros would be 2% of the trip. Now, the taxes that are being now paid in hotels in Barcelona or in Mallorca, which are tourism taxes to try and, and compensate uh, the damage caused by tourism, are around one to three years, depending on the hotel category. And we're still talking about one percent. So we are already applying some measures and we should strengthen those measures we should support the proposal that karima is making because tourism that is a sector that generates environmental problems should be able to compensate somehow those damages that it causes by having these direct or indirect taxes that will allow us to invest that money in compensating the damages so i am in i i mainly work on tourism, uh, nature tourism, or in natural spaces, and not so much city tourism. But just like you, when you pay to enter a museum, you should pay to enter natural spaces, or at least have some sort of compensation so that we can better manage those spaces, whether it is the Antarctic or the Ordesa Natural Park or the Galapagos. Actually, the Galapagos have been using this tax. It's $100 or $200, and it has an important repercussion, not so much in the uh, national park, but also the population that lives in the island. So the... So, The tourism in the previous model, because I think that this crisis is going to make us rethink everything in Spain this summer, Cantabria and Asturias have, have broken the records when other regions had a big crisis. Well, um, rural tourism and nature tourism are the ones that were working best. So I think that it is uh, the right time to start thinking that tourism in this new scenario is going to be different and i think the time has come for us to think what changes need to be made and we can think about the document that we have created that goes a bit in that sense in that direction where should we mark the the way for the tourism of the future in that sense i would also like to ask aurora when as a consultant she talks about sustainable tourism What does she refer to when you talk about sustainable tourism? What is it you mean from your point of view? What should sustainable tourism include? Is it just that? Is it just having a green tax, a, a touristic tax, tourism tax to be used to, to mitigate the uh, damages caused by tourism? Or what other elements could be included here? Well, I think that the definition of, of sustainable tourism is one of the big gaps that we still have, and mainly in the field of, uh, of bodies such as the, the uh, World Tourism Organization. We have still... Um, 
Definitions that are, are a bit vague. I actually uh, participated in Argentina in an online fair, which was called Intelligent Destinations. And my intervention was just to insist that if we're talking so much about intelligent destinations, new technologies, big data, and data in general, then let's try and really benefit from that so that we can have a better management of destinations. I think that this is a time when we have to think if destination management and all of this sustainability concept can uh, start being included in indicators and managing indicators. What, why should we use big data just to know um, you know, how much is being consumed with visas and what people buy and so on? Uh, because that's something that obviously the market uses because they're free to investigate if they if they want to. But I also want to know what impact temperatures are having. How can we see the future with, with the increase of the water level, if the water rises and coastal destinations that we have in Spain are very urbanized. So a carbon footprint is something that we need to consider. The uh, destination management has to go through the development of indicators, but very specific indicators that allow me to compare what uh, tourist leaves, because we obviously have to eat and, and destinations need to keep on doing tourism, but we need to compare what tourists leave with the damage that they cause. Galicia is the... Um, and in Galicia, they have the only city that has actually done an evaluation of carbon footprint. I'm sorry, no, it's Valencia, Valencia who did it. And it was Valencia who did it. And something that I found interesting were the methodologies. The methodologies need to be advanced. We have, we have to keep on working on them. But for instance, with regards to cities, especially cities that have a coastline, there is a phenomenon lately that is worrying me quite a bit, which is the the cruise phenomenon. These cruises that are a sort of hotel on the water that uh, does not really add value to the cities, but they have an important impact and we don't know what's the carbon footprint because they only spend an hour in the city, so we don't know what's the carbon footprint in that city. I really like the study, the Valencia study. It's a first big step towards measuring this, these sorts of actions. And, and that allows me uh, to go on the line that everyone is, is, is mentioning, which is having, uh, having policies that will allow us to, to set up taxes, green taxes, so those who pollute pay. That's the basic principle. And the carbon footprint, should be um, an element needed for the management of destinations and tourism. And, and I also wanted to say mass tourism, mass tourism, mass tourism is something that we will touch upon later, I'm sure, but I want to talk about low-cost tourism in Spain. It's unthinkable for us to continue with a model that has flights that that can be five euros worth or 20 euros. That's It's not because of the sort of tourism that comes, it's because of the impact that it has. And usually people who fly uh, don't really spend much in the cities that they visit. So we have to try and find tourists that are a bit more select, or at least that they um, are aware of the fact that they need to spend more. So we are not sacrificing, and I'm sorry for the, for the expression, but we're not sacrificing our... Uh, or our customs or our well-being, rural well-being or coastal well-being to receive a sort of tourism that is more of a predator, a predator than anything else. Not in every case, but that's the big challenge that we have in our Spanish model, apart from the carbon footprint and also including uh, taxes and, and restrictions through prices, because in the end, consumers only react to prices, unfortunately. Okay, so in that sense, Karima, who actually works in mobility, I'm sure she can tell us what initiatives are being put in place. Are there measures? Are we promoting that low-cost uh, tourism with public subsidies to airlines? Recently, we read the news saying that the impact and emissions of airlines in Europe is three times bigger than what we suspected. So it's actually something that worries us much, the impact of aviation. But um, at the same time, we're still promoting 
the possibility of flying with low prices, which as Aurora was saying, is what this what allows for this low cost tourism to exist. This tourism that we have here in Spain for binge drinking and so on, they only come here to spend as little as possible and and they live um, an important footprint. I don't know if in Europe they're considering the situation and they're taking measures apart from this tax that you were mentioning and the line in the budget. Are there other measures? Do you think that something is changing? Do you think that we're still continuing in the same, in the same way we had before these months when we had stopped? I completely agree with what... Uh... <laughs> yes, I <laughs> Oh, right, right. Uh, but the big question is uh, what uh, what is the massification of global tourism? We have a big problem with this. When you talk about tourism and low cost, the link is very easy. That's the reason why we need, uh, I believe, now, for example, airlines. Airlines um, are already receive public aids is not normal normally it's 25 billions euro 25 billions is too much that's the reason why airport um, for me is very a strong temporary temporary solution to a long-term problem inside uh, of using a home powerful model we should work on transition strategy and means of financing. That's the reason why one of my big fights in Europe when you talk about aviation is a time to push. I'm a partisan of kerosene tax. Kerosene tax, why? Because at this moment, 40%, 40% of the cost of low cost company is fuel. Is, ex is it explain how firm, firms uh, with, uh, with, with uh, such a business model benefit from the last tax haven in Europe, kerosene. And uh, while there are kerosene, um, at this moment we have a tax. We have a tax on diesel, on petrol, on oil, on gas, but kerosene is tax exempt. Throughout Europe, this taxation is an exception on kerosene tax up to back to 1944, when member state party to have the Chicago Convention agreed to promote international civil aviation. Back then, the argument was what it could contribute the threat, friendship, and understanding between nation and people. Of this, uh, of this world, but today facing the climate emergency, we cannot tolerate this statu quo. That's the reason why I cannot understand why Europe don't want to push this carousel tax. We have a carousel tax in the uh, United States, in Japan, in Russia, etc. Such just just a just a just a one very important number. Such uh, tax will reduce by 12% CO2 emission around for, um, 70, 17 million tons per year. And this measure will bring around 27 billion, 27 billion of euro each year, each year for only 0 0.33 uh, uh, sends light liter. It's crazy. It's crazy. This <laughs> what what can do now? We need to push. We need to a very clear campaign about this kerosene tax. I believe. Pues bueno, es una desde luego es una absolutely. It's an initiative that we would be glad to see approved because we would be able to reduce emissions and we would get at least some funds to fight against the impact. Javier was saying, Javier Benayas was saying that with regards to promoting tourism, tourism, internal tourism in Spain, we have in 
areas in the interior of Spain that are quite empty, areas that have been marginalized in the world of tourism, except for certain places where everyone goes, which in the end suffer as well uh, due to the impact of tourists, all of the people that go see them. But other areas are unknown and they're not so widely visited. Could you tell us if the model that we currently have, the tourism model that we currently have, we all want to travel, we all like to travel. If it were to be transferred to other areas, do you think that we could have impacts in those areas as well? Could we, could we, could we find a way to, um, to, to, to reach a balance so that we have a sustainable tourism? Well, doubtlessly, yes, I think that if we change the destination and those tourists now start traveling to natural spaces, then the problems are going to increase. I always give the example of Island, Iceland. Iceland, in two years' time, went from having 200,000 uh, tourists to 3 million tourists. Iceland is the, uh, the, the best nature destination because they don't have anything from a cultural standpoint they don't have cultural elements that are considered relevant enough to be visited what you visit is the the um, geysers and the cascades the waterfalls natural environments so these environments that uh, start receiving two billion people because you know that they all visit the same waterfalls, the same hazards, the same everything. So in the end, these this pla these places are not prepared and they, they don't have they don't have um, the means to accept all those people and then they're damaged and it's very difficult to to deteriorate them. So so the uh, nature or rural tourism, I think it's positive. I think it's good. I think it's good for it to happen, but we need to be prepared. We need to be able to manage um, models to manage that tourism, even more so in urban environments, because the urban environments can really welcome that tourism, but natural environments are more fragile and it's more difficult for them to, to welcome that tourism. So it's good in the sense that we can make tourism less massive let's uh, tourism mass tourism if it's small houses that um that welcome our family since we they didn't have hotels to to welcome those three million uh, tourists then there will um there were rooms getting ready all over the 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 the, the country and that wealth was redistributed all over the all over the country so that they could get out of the crisis that iceland had suffered from so tourism was one of the ways to get out of the crisis because the wealth was well distributed by creating these housing or or touristic housing in private homes so this model, I believe, has this element, this positive element of distributing wealth, because you know that tourism is usually controlled by big companies. Or, and if we decide to do a small scale tourism that generates more income, that would allow, for instance, for rural areas that are now getting empty, and if we now start going to that empty Spain that is now uh, quite in, on vogue in, in the media, then they could have a complementary income and important revenue. So in rural areas right now, in Spain, rural tourism is the main element that can set population in the area. That's for the, the regions not to be left uh, without population, because that is also a serious problem. So it does have positive aspects. It has negative aspects as well. And as we, as every time we think about uh, any topic, we have to highlight the positive and we have to control the negative aspects. But there are negative aspects and we cannot let them evolve in an uncontrolled way, because if we do not detect the problem, we will have that problem, a much more complex problem that will be more difficult to solve. Okay, we have some questions here on our chat, which I'm glad to see. And I encourage you all to send questions to our speakers. And it comes all the way from the Canary Islands, from Gran Canaria. Carlos Lobaina, 
is asking you, I don't know if Aurora could answer or one of you, one of the three could answer from the, from Gran Canaria. Now that COVID has had an impact in the touristic sector, especially in the islands, do you think that this is the right time for the hotel business to implement more circular economy measures within their own establishments? And how can we incentivize for them to do that change, which is a completely radical change in many cases? I don't know, Aurora, Javier, I don't know if maybe you could answer this question, Aurora. Well, I think that this crisis has come at the right time for all of us to think and rethink things. Well, all crises are the, the right moment to think and rethink. What scares me is this pressure to get out of the crisis, and I understand it because people are really suffering and we need to be conscious and aware of that. But this temptation of going back to the old patterns or the old models of production, to call them um, something, uh, touristic pa pa patterns, um, I think that's not, it's not going to be there. I think that this is a very delicate moment. First of all, hunger and need um, are not the best um, counselors. And that's what scares me, but it is the time to completely change things. We need a drastic change. And two years ago, I was at a meeting, a series of meetings that the ministry hosted with the Secretary of Tourism. And one of the things that I, that I said, I wasn't very successful. They didn't really listen to me. We said that if we were leaders in tourism, in touristic products and touristic policy, because we have been copied all over the world, why don't we decide to be leaders as well in a sustainable tourism development? Why don't we take the step? Because I know that this involves, when we talk about sustainability, nobody dares say that at some point we have to reduce, we have to limit and even forbid. And this is something that people don't dare say. And that is why we have definitions that are so politically correct, such as the Brunland Report and so on, and all these uh, works that have been published. Sustainability to me is to start thinking about certain things. We have to reduce uh, flows in certain places, limit, it, limit them in certain places. We have, for instance, in, in internal areas, for instance, but here in the Valencian community, we can't get out of Valencia. So, the touristic authorities are not thinking about having access control for natural areas because they are completely saturated, especially during the weekends. So, so we're going to management models. Up till now, the management models have been almost exclusively based on marketing and the creation of products. And I think that we have to advance. I think that... Um, we have we always have a management body that focuses on these other aspects that is a bit more um, market and then the political side of things and the political side of things needs to start acting and that's why I wanted to talk about Valencia because for the first time they have measured the carbon footprint in the city and although there are some limitations and some points that I haven't seen such as um, cruises and the little impact that they have because they, they don't stay much in the city, we have to start measuring these things and how we, uh, how we react and we all need to participate or things are going to go badly. Obviously, who is going to do this? Who is going to who is going to set the limits because it's very difficult. It's not going to be simple. And as for a circular economy, I think it's a wonderful idea. I think that right now there are some amazing ideas, not, not simply circular economy. One of the things that the uh, World uh, Tourism Organization, I mean, they have given some recommendations, but before the pandemic, I was in a campaign to reduce the use of plastic. I don't know how that ended, what the campaign uh, was, but we have to start with all of these actions in in a very, very uh, strong way. We have to be, we have to react because we can't detect microplastics in human beings due to the water that we drink. Yes, human beings in the Antarctica, as Javier knows very well, in remote places in the Arctic, they're all over the place, those small plastics. And I had a question here for Karima that has been sent to us from another touristic place, which is Mallorca in the Balearic Islands. And let me, because I, okay, here's a question. 
Well, it's for Karima or some other speaker, but since she talked about the taxes, they say you talk about fiscal measures, taxes in the Balearic Islands. We were pioneers in setting up taxes when we had a tax in, in the year 2000, and also the need to, to manage destination. But thinking about the future and in the mid to long term, shouldn't we just focus on a degrowth of tourism and that maybe could be in line with what Aurora was saying now. We we need more time just for this question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, because it's a big debate, really a big debate uh, when you talk about, for example, uh, the, the, the the financial aspect in tourism, but we need, um, each time we need a, a short term and a long term. And when you talk about a fiscal problem, for me, it's a, we, we have a positive experience, you know, about sustainable development. In a Balearic Iceland, for example, you know that. You know the system who were sustainable. Be careful because for me, sustainable tourism is not a tourism that uh, would assume uh, is environmental responsibility by donating a few euros for a charity <laughs> for a charity cause. It's not this. It's not this. For me, carbon of of offsetting. Uh, can have a direct impact on destination. I can be a pretext of a culture exchange between travelers and local around the local environmental issue. During our, our last commission meeting, an actor of, in Sardin in Liberté is an association in France proposed to integrate this practice into the program of the stay and the Host territory in Sardinia, for example, travelers can spend a day ticket care of a forest along, alongside Sardinian shepherds and foresters. And I think it's an idea which makes more sense, really. And I would like to come back in your very interesting question about what say uh, Orara about uh, the crisis about COVID. Because I say, we need, we need to think another model now. What I say that, because the COVID, the COVID uh, pandemic has our mobility globally in a, in a present scale, causing, because we have the liberal market mechanism of global tourism to be severely disrupted disrupted by this COVID. It's crazy, but it's true. In turn, this situation is leading to decline of certain mainstreaming business formats and some, and, and the emerge another. And I believe this crisis, this crisis has therefore brought us to a fork in the road giving us the perfect opportunity to select a new direction, a new, uh, to move forward for, for adopting a more sustainable path. And, and we have just, just this example. This summer, it was crazy in France, in Germany, in Spain. What's happened this, this summer? It's true that local, local and slow tourism were one of the main answer to the crisis just during the summer. It's crazy, but people hop on the eggs and say, wow, in Spain, we are another region very exciting or another country very exciting. It's not necessary to take a plan, go to other place uh, <laughs> in, uh, in America states or in a, uh, in China, etc., we can open just a local perspective. That's the reason why I believe 
we need to change the paradigm, a real of paradigm. I do it is be enough to for us a new ecosystem of post uh, capitalism economy and collaborative business model. But memory following crisis and disaster tend to be short and sooner rather than later. Things return to the statu quo. It is a big risk of our situation. The other reason why I believe this pause, this crisis has COVID, we have a pause. We find ourselves in at this moment of the possibility of sketching a new way forward in the year to come. That's the reason why we must, of course, caution that for her, that should not be limited only to intellectual reflection on theory building as a side, whether we shall start taking responsibility by being active participant and enabling sustainable change to happen. But I say again, we need you. We need to push your government. We need to push local, the local institution. We need to push all actors. Why I say that? Because it's very hard, it's very a big sectors. We need all participants to change this paradigm. It's not easy, mm -hmm. but we need to do that now. Sorry, Rosa. <laughs> For the time. Javier, ¿qué quiere, qué quiere además de, eh, completar tu Javier seems to, to be willing to complete this. Yes, I think this is an important topic, the degrowth of tourism. On the one hand, I'm not optimistic. I think that as soon as the vaccine gets here, people are going to want to travel much more Javier, and all no the escucha. trips uh, Javier I'm sorry we cannot hear you we cannot hear you well is there a, a sound problem it, it, was it me well, you cannot hear me I'm, I'm, I'm sorry they asked me to take it off but I will put it once again okay I was saying that I think that the situation, the degrowth situation is not going to happen. Actually, it's going to go the other way. It's going to increase because they said that the virus was going to make us better. I am convinced that when the vaccine gets here, people will be like crazy traveling everywhere and tourism is going to shoot over the data that we had pre-COVID. Pre and with regards to this question, um, tourism is not sustainable because we live in a non-sustainable world and tourism is just a reflection of global society. And I like to always give a very clear example. I was born in 1958, so I, ha I, I am 62. And there is 7.5 billion inhabitants in planet Earth. When I was born 62 years ago, there were only 20, 27. Uh, 27,000 uh, million. So, so in just one generation, which is my generation, we have gone from 2,500 to 7, 7 uh, to from 2.5 billion to 7.5 billion. Is it possible to stop this growth and that the capacity to consume and to travel has multiplied itself in an enormous way in these last few years? So. So trying to put the brakes on tourism is not enough. We have to rethink the economy and the social and economical system that we're in. That we're in. The amount of people that are on earth with the level of consumption that we have leads us to a situation where our children, our grandchildren we're going to, are going to live in a far worse than, than we did because they will not be able to to enjoy the environments that we have enjoyed. My son um, traveled uh, all through China last summer from one point to the other, and he said, I was never alone. It was always filled with people, so many people that it was actually difficult to be there. I'm from Toledo, and I have suffered Toledo as a, as a touristic destination uh, for decades now. So I think that it is the, the time has come for us to think, to think. But I think that the 
society is not is not following the direction that we want to set for it. We're the minority. We can say whatever we want here. We can preach whatever we want, but we are preaching over a desert, a general desert. And most of the politicians and most of the society do not want to listen to these messages. Why? Because they want to enjoy life and they don't really care. They care. They don't care at all about what their children and grandchildren are going to enjoy. So we're not thinking about a vision of society as a whole. We are. We have a selfish vision of our current presence in, in planet Earth. And well, there are some ecologists who say that the best uh, sustainable tourism is Benidorm to get all the tourists in the less in the in the smallest space possible, so that they destroy less. And this is a concept, I mean, considering all the people that exist from an ecological point of view, it's funny, isn't it? But but that's, so the concept of sustainable tourism is, it can be debated in Galapagos, for instance. We were there doing a study on emissions on carbon footprint, um, tourism carbon footprint, and the most ecological um, hotel was uh, the most expensive and the one that had most uh, carbon emissions per tourist. So you can see that there's a counterposition there with concepts. Well, with regards to this, there is another question when you were saying that society is not listening, that politicians are not listening. You are a scientist, right? And there is a question here that says, do we see in the tourist section uh, sector, uh, Aurora, who you're an advisor and you work for the uh, World Tourism Organization, is there a relationship between the touristic companies and the scientific world? Are there some connections or are these links very weak? Jose A. Macia is asking this question. If there is a link between tourism and science, well, not really, not much. I started working and collaborating with the World uh, Tourism Organization because a few years ago there was a, a person who was very relevant, both in the Spanish tourism as well as in the World Tourism Organization, who we decided that universities and training centers needed to be in the World Tourism Organization. Why? Well, because there was, a, well, the, the, the training we had was quite weak. It was not harmonized from one country to the next. There was a constant confusion between what was um, catering and, and restoration and tourism, but we have made quite a bit of progress. But I don't think that there is connection. The greatest connection is mainly with with marketing and how to generate more and more and more. So, so this vision of let's create more and well, I have always, obviously it's the only thing that we have left in Spain to think, well, instead of having more tourists, more international tourists, could we get less who spend more? Because we have sacrificed so much. I have. I come from Valencia, from the coastline, and the coast is completely full. It's completely urbanized, but not just in Valencia, all over the place. So to me, this is a very important sacrifice. It's a very important sacrifice. So there isn't really much link between tourism and and natural science or experimental science. But what I would like to say is that, well, Javier has talked about the fact that there is resistance, and I completely agree. When this crisis finishes, everyone is going to start traveling, and I include myself because because I I know I I, I am going to keep on traveling, and I'm sure about I'm sure of this. That's on the one hand because we want to enjoy life. Despite all of the things that we have said, and despite the fact that I am aware of what happens, but and I will be responsible, but I still want to travel to some places that I want to get to see. But I think that people want to have fun, they want to enjoy, and just like we created emissions markets, why can't we create some sort of mechanism? And each citizen in the world will have to pay um, or will have X emissions. Um, or carbon, we'll, we'll have this or that carbon footprint. We could do that because price is there, cost is there. 
and there are mechanisms to do it. But what we need to have is, well, there is a pressure of the industry and certain lobbies who are not going to allow for that to happen because they are reluctant to change. We have to understand it, we have to work on it. And this is where governments and institutions have to help. It's not just us. We, we ask them to think, we can be aware, we can change our, our way of being, but, but it's mainly governments and institutions. And the EU, I believe, has a fundamental role not just the Spanish government, but the EU. So that's an open road, the EU. And it seems that we're making progress, but very slowly with regards to this. I'm going to read another question that I have read on the chat because it, it is referring to this. Do you think that by sacrificing natural spaces such as the uh, south of Cantabria or Asturias, with regards to this uh, tourism, a delocalized tourism that is decentralized. If sacrificing these natural um, areas by filling it with um, wind farms, we could, um, we could somehow have more tourism or less tourism because we have on the one hand the need to have renewable energies and also the need to have mountains of natural spaces because mountains are attractive for this sort of tourism. I don't know, maybe Javier can say something about this, about this topic. I think that it doesn't have to do directly with tourism. I think that that is about planning and, and finding balance. Life on planet Earth works because we have free energy, mainly solar energy, but we also have wind. What's best? to bed for solar and wind or to to use um, fossil fuels? Well, obviously we have to bed for um, renewable energies. Do we have to set windmills in every mountain, in every place? Well, I don't think so. We need to find balance and it's complicated, but it's logical that in some places, the local population needs to have a voice and say they don't want windmills. And I think it's reasonable for them to say that decisions cannot be imposed um, from the top to bottom and the local population should be able to sh to agree or disagree with these decisions and be a part of the decision making process and in management decisions are never easy and this i'm sure is one of the most difficult decisions it has its positive aspects lots of positive aspects and some negative aspects that also need to be taken into account and we need to find a balance so i know the uh, area of uh, palencia's mountains and i wouldn't want windmills to be there but i don't know the topic in depth to know if they have asked the local population if local population is for or against so i can't really um i can't really assess the situation at that level i would like to ask kalima what initiatives from European countries are being set up that are working, that are really working in order to have a sustainable tourism? Do you know of any initiatives that are being set up or legislations that are being set up in, in European countries that go towards this fair tourism, low in carbon tourism, or isn't anyone doing this? Can't we, do we have a reference or don't we? At the moment in Europe, uh, we have because you talk about planification. So the reason why in, uh, in Europe, we need a new tourism strategy. And this new European strategy must be in the Green Deal. What, what does it mean concretely? I believe including details, action plan with a short, medium and long term objective. Is it sure? Is it a, a sure way to propose to the member state a state clear, strategic and result-oriented objective? What is the, the medium term? What could do to make the relentless of the sector match the Green Deal objective? Is first of all, we need clarity, we need to clearly establish governance in the tourism sectors to measure sustainable criteria. Because uh, when you talk about 
tourism sector in Europe, we have only economic criteria. We, we don't need that. That's the reason why we need economic, social, and environmental impact with clear metric control and monitoring so the tourism activity foster an inclusive and fair growth at the local scale, first of all. Secondly, we needed to establish a clear action plan to help the sector manage to the, manage the, the twin transition to digital and greener, including safety and social, because we need to protect employment. There are also eternal key importance of the EU, demand important in us to be taken into account in all European policy decision and our, and our initiative, for instance, the CO2, the CO2 impact of any policy decision is now considered as a matter, of course, in all EU matters. It is essential that the impact of all EU policy decision of the tourism sector be, uh, be all, always considered. And for me, I, I, I say, and O'Hara um, said that, this crisis has to be used as an opportunity, as an opportunity mm -hmm. to all we need to be rebuilding the tourism sector is a sustainable and a resilient way. We are sticking into a long-term perspective. I, and I, I am really believe far and sustainable reconstruction requires. That. What does it mean? First of all, we need taking into account the European 2050 target on carbon neutrality in line with the objective of Paris Agreement, first of all. Two, in order to help achieve this objective, the Parliament consider is very necessary first to address the issue of the mode of transport by encouraging and no polluting mobility, such as cycling or rail transport. If you invest on cycling and Rail transport is a good for the job, is a good for the climate. And the next year will be the year of the rail in Europe. So we will make mm -hmm. it happen. And we need just, mm -hmm. is my, uh, the last, but I, I believe the, the least word because it's very important what say, uh, Javier, 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 yes. Javier or Javier? Javier? Javier. <laughs> I'm sorry with my uh, Spanish accent. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, it's not a problem for you. Great. I believe we need really. Uh, sometimes people is very hard to change the comportment. It's very hard. So I would like to conclude. I totally agree that the notion of tourism, as we know, is today a powerful business to environment. We, but we need to get away from passive and too often superficial way of monitoring of only retaining what the shown so. Mm -hmm. And it was a, one of famous author in France, Proust. You know Proust, yes. Proust used to say the only true uh, voyage will be not to travel through um, a hundred uh, different lands with the same pair of eggs, but to see the same land through uh, a hundred different pair of eggs. That it mean is, I think is a good track to follow. It's time to say now, we cannot tourism. We cannot tomorrow the tourism. We cannot make the same comportment. But be careful. Mm -hmm. Be careful because in the future of this tourism, we cannot create a fracture with the poor people and the rich people. 
because for the rich people it's a privilege to to use their right this right of tourism and the poor people cannot go to another country etc that the reason why we need to to create a new world with inclusive tourism be careful with this fracture okay gracias muchas gracias karima uh, bueno, Thank you so much, Karima. I think that one of the things that have been mentioned, not only do we need to change tourism, because yes, absolutely, it's unsustainable and it is generating many emissions, we need to change our model, but there's also another question, another matter, which is how climate change is also going to force new generations to change the kind of tourism that they do. So will there be, this is something that Javier was saying, if we will have that effect of climate change on the sort of tourism that we will see in the future. I don't know, Aurora, if you would like to take that question. I, I think that, well, I insist. I think that we all love to travel and, and I'm referring to, to myself, but when we have such chip trips, such as the ones that we have had in the last few decades, what this generates is a huge impact, huge economic impact, positive impact, because they, it has reached secondary cities. These low cost uh, lines have uh, gotten to secondary cities, but mainly it has caused uh, an environmental impact that is enormous. So unfortunately for me, human beings only respond or mainly respond to prices. And we either they use an environmental policy that is harsh from an environmental standpoint, or this will not change. I think that the question, Aurora, was rather how climate change can change the sort of trips that are being taken. So if since in our country, for instance, there will be more heat waves during the summer with temperatures that are not bearable. Well, that, that is actually something that is quite, quite, quite mentioned. The Mediterranean with an increase in temperatures, um, an increase of six degrees um, is going to be unbearable in summer. So in summer, we will have a very few international tourists. They will not come from outside of Spain. And what we will have will be emerging destinations such as the north of Europe, they will be fresher and people will um, decide to go there for the summer. And the Mediterranean will have two big seasons, what is now springtime and fall. So maybe it can be an advantage because the seasons uh, will change the use of spaces, of, of spaces that have already been built. It's true that the problem is to what extent is this going to change the flora, the fauna, and obviously the consequences of the big um, weather phenomenon, because this is going to force us to, uh, to make public investments, high public investments to maintain our coastline and to maintain a, um, a minimum quality in our beaches. And actually tourism is going to be very expensive for everyone. It's going to be expensive for the pockets of Spaniards and uh, especially for the citizens in the coastline in the mountains. We have seen it as well. Uh, there's little snow. Snow is only falling in the higher mountains. We will have to use artificial cannons that makes it more expensive, etc. So we have to rethink this. Yes, we have been talking about the impact of climate change in tourism, and we have been doing it for some time. But I think we have to start doing something in an effective way, and this has to come hand in hand with uh, decisions by institutions and governments. We can think as much as we want. We can have an intellectual uh, conversation, scientific conversation. We can have all sorts of experimental science conversations, but the future is there. The science has said that climate change is real. And it's true, and it's coming, and we're feeling it. And, and we're feeling it in a very important way. So it's what Javier has said, with 7.5 billion inhabitants in the world, we either change the way we consume, or this is going to explode. There is a question, I don't know, Javier, if you want to add something, if not. 
Yes, and Tony usually asks me questions, and he's asking me about the same thing, and I want to answer him. Um, he still insists on the topic of whether we need to degrow in tourism. I think that una, una experiencia que fue have la... an experience which was a crisis of 2008 to 12, 2012 and there were some provinces that actually withheld that crisis we did that study what cities or what provinces were more resilient which ones responded best to that crisis and there is a study that shows two things first that those cities or provinces that best withheld were the ones who had diversified their economy and second those who had really fed for the primary sector for instance extremadura was one of the um, autonomous regions that best withheld the crisis there was less unemployment during the 2008 2012 uh, crisis extremadura which is one of the regions that is uh, more held back but it's its economy is based in the primary sector and those that were more diversified, for instance, the Basque country and the provinces in the Basque country. So, having said that, we are learning our lesson. Spain has, has already considered that tourism is the only development engine in many regions and that was a bad strategy. We saw that may be forced by Europe because they never they didn't allow us to grow when we got in the EU in the primary sector and they put lots of limits so that we couldn't include um, livestock and so on and when we had to eliminate lots of of our livestock industries many of our farmers who lived up their livestock had to stop doing that so that must must make us think that not just because of an ecological um, matter, but for an economic matter, we need to diversify our economy. It's fundamental. When I said that the best way to to, to fight against this um, Spain that is getting empty is to use rural tourism. So that is actually diversifying the economy so that the primary sector has some complementary revenues so that living in those areas allows for a reasonable salary compared to, to the city. So I think that that is an aspect that doubtlessly when I when I answered previously, I don't say, I, it doesn't mean that I don't think that we have to, to change the model. We do have to change the economic model, especially in some regions where the touristic sector has too big of a weight, an exaggerated weight. And I also understand one thing, and I really like to say this. Estamos viviendo en un mundo, we eh, are um, living in a world that we are mistreating. I always like to use this metaphor. People who come to a building with different apartments and so on, at the beginning they, they like each other and the house is well treated and the common areas are cared for and there is a good ambience in general in the building. But as years go by, the relationships are deteriorated and that common space is also deteriorated, it's filled with garbage and we still, we start seeing problems in the plumbing and the roof and somehow we start seeing roaches and rats. So roads are the virus that has appeared. It's just a warning, a warning that that common space, which is our planet, we are mistreating it. And the problem is not the virus itself. The virus is just uh, a warning that many other problems are about to come. The level of uncertainty um, that our children are going to live is awful. And this is just, this is just um, a warning. And in this situation, and Kalima was saying that we either bet for a change going from have more resilient um, economic structures that are capable to answering to this uncertainty and crisis scenarios that are about to come because it's unavoidable this the model that we live in right now with all these inhabitants and consumption it doesn't have a future we are driving a car at a hundred kilometers per hour and we are straight going to the cliff and we don't know at how many meters the cliff is but we know that we're going towards the cliff we don't know how how soon we will crash but we know that we will crash so what's the alternative and and there is another question just to answer the other question 
I teach um, a class in the uh, degree for tourism, which is the environmental impact of tourism and sustainable tourism. And I had to fight for it to be included in this, in the degree of tourism. And there are many tourism degrees that don't have this, this, um, this class. So if the future managers or the future tourism technicians are not being taught currently, some kind of training so that they know that they have to bet for a different kind of tourism with different a different model with different criteria, then it means that we're not preparing the new generations to be able to tackle this from a technical standpoint. That is why the role of the university in these topics is basic, because it can be the transformation element for, for the future, at least in the touristic sector, that they will lead in the future. Well, I would like because we don't have much time we only have 11 minutes for this for this wonderful uh, debate round table there are going to be many things left unsaid i'm sure but i would like i, I would like to add one thing if you don't mind uh, to what javier has just said. i i i wanted i wanted um in my university we do have that that class sustainable tourism but my criticism was because I think that the concept of sustainability is being dealt with in many classes. So very often you don't need a class. You don't have to need a specific class. I do, uh, my class is touristic policies and I always talk about that concept. What really shocks me is when I teach my third year students, when I talk about sustainability, it bores them because they say, we have already done it. No, we're going to see it from a different perspective because what we have done is uh, make a great effort in general so that because there is an institute in Switzerland, you know, that uh, measures the competitiveness, touristic and non-touristic competitiveness for economy in general. And that is an, a, an amazing effort. So these are reports that are worth a lot of money and they have been done, but they're not making the same effort to measure sustainability. And this is something that Karima was saying. And I have for a very long time been saying to my students, um, I have been saying that to my students for a very long time, why don't we measure the sustainability of elements? Why do we measure something as complicated as competitiveness? And we have not made that effort for sustainability. So the World uh, Tourism Organization in the year 2017, they organized, if I'm not wrong, a, an international conference in Manila in the Philippines, and they set up a group of experts to start measuring sustainability. Well, I haven't seen the results. I don't know if they have issued the report or not. But I would love for us to really give um, sustainability the role it has, especially in the World uh, Tourism Organization. We haven't said it because we said it in the introduction. Uh, the European, uh, the Spanish uh, Network for Sustainable Tourism, we have a guide with a series of indicators that can be used initially, such as a self-evaluation, but as a reflection point to use the sustainable uh, goals in touristic um, sectors. And I think that it is in the line of what you're saying, Aurora. So within this report, we um, have touristic indicators and sustainability indicators of the of the sustainable goals, sustainable development goals, and the GDP, the per capita GDP of touristic origin, and the number of tourists per inhabitant are negatively correlated to this uh, sustainability indicator. So the touristic model that we currently have is not contributing to sustainability, it is going against sustainability. But funnily enough, when, when we um, link it to the 17 SDGs, the SDG that is most linked to sustainable tourism, which one do you think it is? You're not going to believe it. Out of the 17 SDGs, which one do you think has a greatest relationship with uh, the development of sustainable tourism? I don't know, 16, number 16. Peace, justice, and having a society that lives in harmony. Well, that is the SDG, and it makes sense because tourists go to uh, societies that are that don't have risk problems, and that's that's an indicator and um, a clear SDG that is very much linked to sustainability. That is where we have the most direct 
relationship and the report that we created, and it's quite clear. Okay, so it's it's a pity, but we're running out of time. So I, I would like to conclude by highlighting the things that have been said, because I think that during this roundtable, many proposals have been made, and I hope some of them are actually successful because there's 7.5 billion people in the world, but it's also true that we either care for this planet, as Javier said, or no one will want to, no one will go to go anywhere because we all love to see beautiful places, a beautiful fauna, beautiful flora, and we don't want to go see places that are destroyed and that are not in good conditions. So that's, that's the reality. So it's not because of that, that we need to care for the planet, but we have to take it into account nonetheless. And if we want for tourism to keep on uh, existing, we need to preserve the spaces. And of all the proposals, I'm going to mention some of the proposals as a few brushstrokes for the conclusion. So first of all, obviously, low cost is something that we need to finish with. We need to end with low cost by increasing taxes or by setting taxes such as the kerosene tax, as uh, Mukarima was saying, for the aviation or having other green taxes, higher green taxes, higher than what we currently have, so that there really is a compensation uh, of the carbon footprint that tourists leave when they go from one place to the next. We also have to promote the local things, um, a local tourism where we don't need to go for miles to meet, to, to, to see something. We need to be, stay closer from home, but we have to do it with a good environmental management of those spaces so that the impact is not um, too negative in those environments. It seems obvious that at some point we will have to set a limit to tourism, even if it is difficult, as Aurora said, it is difficult for governments and institutions to want to talk about this, because obviously it is not a comfortable topic and it always has an impact in economy. But we have to start taking steps because we are more and more, the population keeps on growing and it keeps on, the number of visitors is also growing. Um, tourism has gone down due to a very specific phenomenon, which is the pandemic. But all the experts are saying that when this pandemic is overcome with some vaccines, we are going to be willing to travel even, even more. So I can't even imagine how many millions of tourists we'll have in 2021, 2022, and the impact that this could have. And then there is a proposal of promoting uh, tourism that will use public transportation or railroads instead of, instead of planes. Training, training of our touristic agents, those who sell tourism and the people who work in tourism and environmental topics is basic. We need to, to train them because the way we manage tourism will have an, an, a lot to do with the impact that tourism will have and also economy. If your economy is only focused in one activity, then it's, it's problematic, as you were saying. If we only promote... Uh, marketing, instead of taking into account other factors, in the end, you're putting all of your eggs in the same basket. And I, that's all I wanted to say. I know that many more topics have been tackled. This was just a short summary of what has been said this afternoon. I wanted to thank you all. Thank you so much for being here with us at the other side of the screen. We don't see you, but we feel you here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you to those who have been um, following this from from very far away. This was possible thanks to the internet, otherwise we would not have had them here. And I would like to thank the Casa Encendida for this series with, um, with these um, roundtables. All of this is being recorded and it will all be available at the YouTube channel of La Casa Encendida. So you will be able to see them again. You will, sh you will be able to share them if you want. And I would like to thank the Foundation Transición Verde and the Foundation uh, Green, the Green European Foundation. Thank you so much for sponsoring this event and thank you to the uh, Casa Encendida for being a part of this event. So I wanted just to say goodbye to everyone. Thank you, Javier, Aurora, Karima. It was a pleasure to be with all of you here. Thank you very much.